today. Glad that you are here. It is sort of a, uh, it's a bittersweet day. Uh, this is still a day that the Lord has made. And we still are rejoicing and glad in it. But a uh, sad day that um, we lost a member of our family. Uh, Brother Clarence Mangle. Uh, just a very good brother in the Lord. Last time I had a, last time he talked to me at, at some length, he was at church. Um, and I think I was over here. He said he wanted to talk to me. He was in the back. And so he said, I want to talk to you up front. And when he got up here, he said, I want you to sit down. He said, but I want to talk over you because I'm older than you. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, but uh, he gave me some um, words of encouragement. I wanted me to know that, uh, that my pulpit ministry had really impacted him uh, great. So that was the last real long conversation I had with Brother Clarence. So uh, just a good man. And so let us pray for the family. Uh, it is a difficult time. And I tell people that I lost my mother four years ago. And I'm not exaggerating when I say it. I think about it every day. I don't think a day has gone by since my mother passed uh, that she doesn't cross my mind. And uh, I just think about something she said or something she did, or I just think about her. So we know that our loved ones who die in the Lord, we know that they're in the presence of the Lord. Um, it's bittersweet and comfort for them, uh, but we still miss it. And so uh, the reason why death has this impact on us is because we need to understand the Bible says the last enemy to be conquered is death. And so death is not a friend, it's an enemy. It is a result of uh, the sin of Adam, which we all inherited in, in our own sins. Sometimes we take ourselves out sooner. Um, or, or we, we go out in a way that uh, is, is not real comfortable. You know, you can live, uh, but your days are just not good. As uh, the preacher reminds us in the book of Ecclesiastes. So, I pray for the family. Amen? Amen. I pray for the family. The funeral's tomorrow, I believe, one at People's Baptist Church. And uh, pray for, we'll see you there to support the family. Um, as you know, we have um, sort of changed our, let's all stand. We sort of changed our worship format. You know. uh, earlier this month, we changed our worship format uh, to more of a first century worship format. Uh, how the first century church uh, conducted their worship services. And, and the reason we did that was because so-called worship is getting more crazier and more wild. And so after a long study and reading church history and uh, reading some other things, some things we see in the scripture, um, we know that the way the apostles organized the churches in the first century and the way that they had church and their worship format, you know, that still is on record uh, in our history. Yeah. And so they received that format directly from Jesus. Yeah. And so I just felt uh, if all else goes wrong, let's do it Jesus way. Amen? Amen. And so we're trying to pattern ourselves uh, in such a way that if it were possible for Paul or Peter to walk in, they would recognize that this is the worship format the Lord gave directly to them. So bear with us. We are still fine-tuning it and uh, switching some things around. Pray for Adrian. He said, he don't know why he's praying in front of his own family. Amen. <laughs> Just pretend like you're on Facebook. Amen? Yes. And uh, you'll be all right. Pretend <laughs> yeah. like you're online and you'll be just fine for the amen. But um, yeah. our scripture reading is in Psalm 3. And um, this is a psalm written by David. 
when he was fleeing from Absalom, his son, and the many people were um, trying to take his life. You know, we read these psalms. Um, the good thing about being on this side of the cross is uh, God has revealed more of his revelation to us since David uh, gave us these words. And so we're to apply this psalm to us today. You know, David is running, he's running from Solomon and many people are trying to take his life. Uh, you know, we can go beyond that. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Uh, those are satanic forces in the heavenly soul. We need to remember behind those who don't like us, there's a greater power at work. And that's the chief enemy and the real enemy. And this is how we can apply this song to our situation because we don't want you to leave church and pray that, you know, you don't like your boss, pray that God kills your boss. Amen? Uh, we don't want you to do that. So let's look at these things in the proper um, perspective. Amen? Amen? Let's read Psalm 3. It's only eight verses, so let's read it together. O oh Lord, how my adversary is at increase. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying to my soul, there is no deliverance from me in God. But you, O oh Lord, are shield about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept, I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O oh my God, for you have sitting all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Our gracious heavenly Father, Lord, receive uh, this word that we ran, read this morning as our heart and minds towards you. Uh, Lord, bless us, strengthen us to worship you and praise you in a manner that is uh, befitting of you. Uh, Lord, we pray that the lost will know that there is salvation in none other than Jesus Christ, for there is no name given among heaven whereby men can be saved other than the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Salvation is by God's grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. It is by repentance of sin and true, genuine, trusting, clinging faith in Jesus Christ. Father God, we pray for the many needs that exist today. We pray for the continued recovery and improvement of, of Deacon Scott. Uh, Lord, we pray once again for the entire uh, Mingo family at the loss of our own. Brother Clarence, uh, Lord, whatever the need might be, uh, Lord, some need that job. Yeah. And Lord, some need other things. And Lord, you know exactly what we need. Yeah. And so, Lord, reach down and meet these needs according to your will and your way. Father God, we praise you and thank you for all things today. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is Genesis chapter 1, verses 20 through 31. Now we continue the uh, historical Revelation to our God regarding creation. And then it's in Genesis chapter 1, verses 20 through 31. Then God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth and the open spans of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm after their kind, and every wing bird after its kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. 
and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed and it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was an evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Amen. Praise Amen. God for reading his word. Up next is our congregational song. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to change our opening song this morning to Psalm 224 in our hymn. In Psalm 122 and verse 1, it says, Let us go into the house of the Lord. The song this morning, we have come into his house. Oh, oh, oh. 
Street stand for the next scripture reading. We will be continuing uh, Psalm 148, verses 7 through 14. Then that's Psalm 148, verses 7 through 14. And it's a continuation of the whole creation and the vote to praise the Lord. Then we'll be reading Psalm 148, verses 7 through 14. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters and all the depths. Fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his words. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and winged fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and virgins, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. And he has lifted up a horn for his people. Pray for all his godly ones, even for the sons of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. Our last uh, reading will be in Matthew, continuing Matthew chapter 1, uh, closing out chapter 1 with verses 18 through 25, uh, giving us the historical uh, genealogy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then that's Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 25. Yes, uh, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep, and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Bless the Lord for the reading of the word. Up next is our choir ministry.
last song this morning is in our program, I Love to Praise Him. Amen. I love to praise His name.
chapter 3, verse 14. So it's sort of a two part deal. Be first. Uh, I'll read all the difficult names. Thank you. And, out, and then I'll let you do the easy one. Amen. Genesis 3, uh, 14 and 15. You know, I was thinking about our worship service, how we incorporated just a lot of scripture Amen. Uh, into the service. Um, it, it's really kind of a sad testimony that we have to adjust to hearing more yes. of what God has to say to us in a service than what we have to say to him. It's just, I don't know if that's a good testimony or not for any church. It, it's something to think about. We have to adjust to having more scripture or more of God's word. Um, I hope we develop the opposite part. We have to adjust to not enough of God's word being ready during the worship service. So that is the goal of saturating you with scripture. Amen? Amen. And so we pray that uh, that will answer the questions that you have on why are we doing this. Amen. Well, let's go to the word of the Lord today. I'm going to read Luke 3, 23 to 38. When I'm through with that, you can read Genesis 3, 14 to 15. And of course, we know Luke 323 of the genealogy of Christ through his mother Mary. And uh, that's why verse 23 starts off as it does. So this is the genealogy of Christ through his mother Mary. And as I've said before, when Mary and Joseph married, her genealogy legally became Joseph's. And that's why this one reads different than the genealogy in Matthew, which is Joseph's family line. And it has his father's name as Jacob in Matthew, but here it has his father's name as Eli. Eli is really Mary's father. But when they got married under Jewish law, her genealogy became Joseph's. And so this is why they read different, but this is the genealogy of Christ's mother Mary. Amen. Three. 2338, when he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Nathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janiah, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Heslai, the son of Nagai, the son of Matt, the son of Matthias, the son of Samin, the son of Joseph, the son of Yoda or Joda, the son of Jonan, the son of Ressa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adai, the son of Kosan, the son of El Madan, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eleazar, the son of Joram, the son of Nathat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonan the son of Eliakim, the son of Mela, the son of Menem, the son of Matha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Solomon, the son of Nashon, the son of Abinadab, the son of Amen, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perak, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Saruk, the son of Reuel, the son of Peleg, the son of Hebar, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arkspah, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jerob, the son of Mahaliel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of of God. Amen? Amen. You can finish by reading Genesis 3. Just two verses, 14 and 15. If you have that again. The Lord God said to the search, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and thus she will eat all the days of your life. God's people say amen. Amen. It is the word of God. 
to be studying how Jesus fulfilled the written scripture. The same written scripture he believed and trusted to be the very word of God. And we know that because often when the Lord would rebuke people, he would say, have you not read what the scripture said? And so to Jesus, what the written scripture said is what God truly has said. So now we're studying how he fulfilled this same scripture in his life. When I speak of Jesus fulfilling the written scriptures, I am speaking of Jesus fulfilling the entire mission given to him by his father by fulfilling the written scripture alone. So the father gives Jesus a specific message to accomplish on earth. And Jesus accomplished that entire mission by fulfilling the written scriptures alone. The Lord spoke of this mission in John 4, 34. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to accomplish his work. The Lord proclaimed he completed this mission in its entirety in John 17, 1 through 4 in his high priestly prayer. It says, Jesus spoke these things and lifted up his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all who you have given to him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. Then the last phrase, the Lord says, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. This mission that Jesus accomplished, that the Father gave him to do, he accomplished it in its entirety by fulfilling what the written scriptures spoke concerning the coming Messiah of Israel, the Christ of the Gentiles, the Son of God, God from God, light from light, eternally begotten and not made. So the Lord fulfilled everything the Father gave him to do by fulfilling what the written scripture predicted or prophesied of him. And I think there are a little over 500 scriptures the Lord fulfilled, as we can see, in the Gospels. That Jesus completed the mission given to him by his father by fulfilling scripture alone is very clear. Luke 24, 25, 27, after the Lord rose from the dead, he meets two of his disciples on the Emmaus Road. And he begins to tell them why the Christ accomplished the thing that they were been discussing. And the Lord said to them, and he said to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, was it that not was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then the rest of the text it says, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And so it is my to you that if Jesus, who was God incarnate in human flesh, the one who was and is truly God and truly sinless male humanity with the XY male DNA chromosome. Gotta say that today because we don't know what a man is today. <laughs> you could be a woman and say, I feel like a man, and we're supposed to say he. Jesus was a real he. Amen. XY male chromosome, a sinless human male man. If he could accomplish all the Father gave him to do during his mission on this earth by fulfilling the written scripture alone, then I say that same written scripture all by itself is enough for us to be all that God wants us to be, to live this life from the moment we are saved to the moment we open our eyes in the conscious presence of the Lord. If it was enough for Peter to fulfill all doctrine 
that the written scripture alone is sufficient for all things in the believer's life is what we call the doctrine of scriptura so or simply that's the Latin for the term scripture alone it is defined as follows in the Westminster Confession of the Faith the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory man's salvation faith and life is either expressed and set down in scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from scripture you know that's very simple let me give you an example of what we, what we can deduce from scripture we see the Lord asleep in a boat that's what men do he wakes up and tells the sea to shut up that's what God does amen and so we can deduce from that that he is both God and man. Yeah. See, we can deduce that from the scripture. Make sense? Yeah. Unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelation of the spirit or the traditions of men. We've already discovered how the Lord fulfilled the written scripture alone in his uh, incarnation and virgin birth. We study how he fulfilled scripture alone uh, through his legal father, the genealogy of his legal father, Joseph, and thus fulfilled both the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenants. And by Jesus fulfilling this, we see that he really is the promised Messiah of Israel and Savior of the Gentiles. And then for the past two sermons, we have been studying how Christ fulfilled the scriptures alone in the genealogy of his biological mother, Mary, in Luke 3. 23-38. And by the Lord fulfilling Mary's genealogy, remember it says it was supposed that the, the, the Mary's genealogy says it was supposed that the Lord was Joseph's son. It was supposed. That's what the people thought. But that was not the truth. The truth was he was only the son of Mary. He was only the seed or offspring of a woman because his father was God. So we see he fulfilled the promised seed in Genesis 3.15 it would only be the seed of a woman but not a man. And how the children of the devil would be in constant conflict with this seed of a woman. This, this man who was the seed of a woman but not the seed of a man. We saw how Jesus he says to the religious Jews, you are of your father, the devil. And you want to do your desires of the devil, John 8, 44. In this group that the Lord identifies, and he says, uh, the devil is your father. They were in a constant state of enmity or hatred and anger against Jesus, the seed of the woman. From the moment he began his ministry to the day, he gave his life on the cross. And so we see how the Lord fulfilled that Genesis 3.15 through Jesus. The seed or offspring of the devil would be in constant conflict against this seed of the woman who had no earthly father. Uh, and so we said this is another sufficient proof that the Lord is the only one who could have been this promised Messiah of Israel and Savior of the Gentiles, for there has never been any other person born on this earth other than Jesus who was strictly the offspring of a woman, but not a man. And the children of Satan were in constant conflict with him. And so, you know, this is how God over and over and over identifies that Jesus, he is the one. Yes. He is the one and only one. Therefore, the Lord said, when, when the Lord was on that mountain and the cloud overshadowed him, and, he, and the voice came out, this is my beloved son. What did he say, do? Hear him. Yes. And so God wants us to keep our mind focused on Jesus, and the way he does this, he reminds us over and over and over, and he just fulfilled the scripture, that uh, the Messiah and Christ of God could be nobody but this God-man named Jesus. It enables us, it strengthens us to continually and all the more put our faith and trust in him. 
Now this morning, I, 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 I want to move on by looking at Mary's genealogy in relation to Jesus fulfilling scripture alone. And I want to press the truth that the only man who has ever walked this earth and who is only the seed of a woman, but not a man. He's the only man who has ever walked this earth who could crush the seed He's the only, he's the, he's the only one who, 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 who could crush the head of the devil. He's the only man that ever walked this earth who had what it took to stand up to Satan face to face, grab him by the head, and crush him into power, into pieces. And this further lets us know, by the Lord fulfilling Genesis 3.15, that there is nobody else like Jesus. Amen. And he is the one. And all that we have and all that we are, we ought to give it up and submit ourselves to this God-man named Jesus. Once again, Genesis 3, 14, 15, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and thus you will eat all the days of your life. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Her seed was Jesus Christ. God goes on to tell Satan, this seed of the woman, he says, he shall bruise you on the head. As we talked several weeks ago, the words God spoke to Satan in these verses, it was a result of, the, uh, 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 of Satan deceiving the woman Eve to eat from the tree in the middle of the garden called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. After Eve ate from this fruit, that God said, don't eat it. The day you do, you shall surely die. Dying, you shall die. She gave some of it to her husband, Adam, who also ate. And God then questioned Adam and Eve as to why they ate from the tree he expressly forbid. Adam blamed it on God, the woman you gave me. <laughs> she gave me that fruit and I ate. And then the woman, Eve, blamed it on the devil by saying, the serpent deceived me. And I am. Now the serpent, the devil, he did deceive me. We read in the New Testament that Paul says by the Spirit, Adam was not deceived, but Eve, the woman, was. So Satan did pull the wool over her eyes, but God did not accept this as an excuse because he gave a clear command. Don't eat from this tree the day you do, or thou shalt surely die or die. You shall die. You shall die spiritually and you shall die physically. Amen. And so as a result of all of this, uh, Adam, the woman you gave me, she made me eat. Uh, Eve, uh, the devil made me do it. And so now God speaks to Satan and he says this to Satan, because you have done this, see this woman. Cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and thus you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity or hatred between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And then he says, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. I've already spent considerable time in the scriptures that the seed of the woman in these verses it can only be Jesus. Because he is the only man ever born who was entirely the seed or offspring of a woman through his virgin uh, conception and birth, but he is not the seed of a man. The Lord Jesus Christ was not a result of the sperm cell of a man uniting with the egg of a woman. He did come from the egg of a woman, but not the sperm or seed of a man. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and she came to be with child and somehow uh, through some way my only God in his infinite mind knows the second person of the Godhead the word who was with God and was God took upon himself flesh in that egg in that womb of Mary and he was born and he was the son of God. The son of Mary and the son of God the only man born who was the seed of a woman and 
he fulfills that. Likewise, he spends considerable time in the scriptures revealing the seed of the serpent. They are the children of the devil. They are those who have not been set free from their slave and sin by Jesus Christ. They are those who reject the truth. They reject the truth of who Jesus is, and they reject the truth of the word of God. These are those the Lord says in John 8, uh, 44, uh, you are of your father the devil, and you will do his desires. Really? However, we haven't spent a lot of time on the serpent spoken in this Genesis 3, 14, 15 text. In which God says to him, the seed of the woman will one day crush, bruise your head. The word bruise in Genesis 3, 15, it's a Greek word, I'm sorry, Hebrew word, shoot. It literally means to crush into power. It means to crush and therefore break up. It means to crush and annihilate it into pieces and render it worthless. In view of this, the head of this serpent will be crushed to pieces or crushed in power or he will be made worthless by the seed of the woman who we know is none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now the question is, who is this serpent whose head will be crushed by the seed of the woman or crushed to pieces by Jesus? Scripture clearly revealed the serpent in Genesis 3, 14, 15 is none other than Satan. Revelation 12, 7 through 9 says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waging war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the old serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, the world of seed, there's in the Greek present tense, it means he constantly, he never stops deceiving the whole world. According to Ezekiel 28, 14, the text which reveals Satan when he was Lucifer. Lucifer originally was not a bad term. So when Satan was Lucifer, he wasn't a bad guy. You put it that way. And so Ezekiel 28, 14, it reveals Satan's exalted state before he rebelled against God and then became formerly known as Lucifer, but now known as the devil. And Ezekiel 28, 14 says, the Lord created Satan. from among a class of angels called cherubim. The text says, you were the anointed cherub who covers. God says, I place you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. The fact that God called Satan the anointed cherub indicates he was the top ranking angel of all the angels classified as cherubim because the writer used the definitive article the in describing him as the cherub. And so Satan was the cherub angel of all the cherub angels. The text also reveals Satan's location of ministry. Before he rebelled against God, it was in the vicinity of the place where the local presence of God was. For the Bible in this text says he was on the holy mountain of God. When I speak of the local presence of God, I refer to the place where if one were able to see it, you would be able to visibly see the glory of God. We can't because God says if you did, you would die. But if we were able to go to this place, we would actually see the visible glory of God. So when I say the local presence, 
presence of God. I'm talking about the place where the visible glory of God can be seen. Satan was in that vicinity, and he walked on the holy mountain of God. Amen. Isaiah 14, 12, and 14 record that at this point in time he was Lucifer, which means son of the morning, light bearer. He became lifted up in pride mm -hmm. and wanted to be like God. This is how it became Satan and the devil. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14 says, God says to Satan, how have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning? King James says, Lucifer, son of the dawn, you have been cut down to the earth, you who weaken the nations, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. And he went on to say, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. It was after this, Lucifer became the devil. And then he unleashed himself upon the realm of mankind. According to Revelation 12 and 4, when Satan fell into this diabolical state, he also deceived one third of the total population of the angels in heaven to follow him. Well, these evil, these angels also became diabolical, evil, and wholly unclean. Apparently, these fallen angels, also known in the New Testament as demons or unclean spirits, they were also unleashed by Satan upon the realm of mankind to do his will. The servant, Satan, formerly Lucifer, is revealed in the written scriptures by many names and titles. And these names and titles reveal exactly how he works. Well, it reveals some of the evils he does and it reveals his diabolical deeds. And as we come to understand these names and titles, God applied to Satan, then we can, we can get some discernment on how he works, and because right now in the church, we have no discernment on the devil. Well, oh, none. <laughs> You're exaggerating, Pastor. None! Yeah. We have none. <coughs> some of these names are, number one, Abaddon. Revelation 9, it means the destroyer. Revelation 12, you don't even call me a king to consider your servant Job. He's only serving you for the stuff you gave him. Well, That's my uh, translation. Uh -huh. He goes up before God and accuses Job. Yeah, Job is serving you, but he only served you because you blessed him with a whole lot of material stuff. Uh -huh. He accuses the brother. Now, he, he, let me say this, and I'm going to move on. Now, Satan did this because the Bible says Joseph was a righteous man right. who eschewed. Job was a righteous man who, uh, who uh, eschewed, or as King James skewed, evil. He says, Job, he, he's a righteous man, the Bible says. And so that's why Satan went up to accuse him. Mm -hmm. Because he was a righteous man that shunned evil. I, I'm just wondering what, what Satan had with, with would that be the basis of accusing us before God? Amen. 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 Come on, tell the truth. See, he did this because this was a righteous man that shined evil. Yes. Amen. I don't know. It looked like a whole lot of Christians. I know that they agree with evil. Amen. Amen. You can't take no stand against what's wrong. Yep. And you can't take a stand against what's clearly wrong in the Bible. But also, we don't want to take a stand on the truth because we don't want to offend anybody. Huh. That's right. Come on. We don't want to offend anybody and give them the word of God and drive them away from Jesus. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? No. They need to hear the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Sinners need to hear that they are lost and bound for hell. Yeah. For that they will be weeping and wailing and the gnashing of things. They need to know that God is angry with the wicked every day. But they also need to know that God has provided a way out through his son, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. We've got to the point we don't want to stay either one 
in the church because we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to tell somebody, look, you're in deep sin. But on the other hand, we don't want to say the Lord is the only way, the truth, and life because we don't want to offend other religions. Mm. Mm. Come on now. I don't think Satan got much word about most of us, man. I'm not sure if he would go up before God and accuse any of us of anything because it seems to me many Christians helped this program now. <laughs> Let me move on. Yeah. He's called the angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11 14. In other words, Satan can deceive people into believing he is a holy angel or a holy messenger from God. He's called the adversary. The Greek word means one who brings distress upon God's people. 1 Peter 5 8. We've already seen he's called the anointed cheru. Ezekiel 28, 14, that is a special class of angelic beings, and apparently Satan is the most powerful one of all. He's called the elder above, the lord or prince of the demons. Matthew 12, 24, the mere fact that the lord is, that Satan is prince of the demons indicates he has a king. Yes. Amen. Amen. A prince is a monarchy term, a kingdom term. And so Satan is prince of the demons. And so there, there is a hierarchy of these evil, fallen, demonic beings, and Satan is their prince. Second Corinthians 6.15 is called the lion, the worthless one, the lawless one. But the word also means the reckless one. Satan is the reckless one. Second Corinthians 6.15. You know, you see a lot of folks living a reckless life. Amen. And we can't figure it out. I don't know what's wrong with you. Yes, sir. I don't know what's wrong with little Jane. I don't know what's wrong with little Susie. They're just doing everything to destroy their lives. Mm. We don't know. We have no idea. I don't know what happened with a little reckless life. I don't know why that girl lived with a reckless life. I don't know why they smoking crap. I don't know why they smoke in how they do a crystal meth and all the weed. <laughs> we don't know why they're just having sex and with everybody. <laughs> Satan is reckless. Yeah. I just told you why. That's the marks of the devil. Yeah. A reckless life. Just throwing all caution to the wind and just doing stupid stuff that everybody else sees is not the thing to do. Recklessness. Somebody must need to hear this. Amen. Taking reckless chances. Recklessness. Yeah. Recklessness. I'll do anything to fulfill this desire of my flesh. Anything. I'll do anything to take. God ain't got nothing to do with it. That is one of the marks of Satan. He is the reckless one. Amen. I'm saying I'm going to move on. Seems to be the deeply inflexible on young folks. As soon as you become of age, I want to go to college in East Europe. <laughs> I want to relocate to southern Hawaii. Now, sooner or later, you need some help. Yeah. I'll live behind. I can get to southern Hawaii. Amen? <laughs> this is craziness. Practice. That is the mark of this. Oh, let me move on. It's satanic. Let me move on. He's called the deceiver, Revelation 27 through 8. He deceives people to believe people and things are really of God when they're really of him. He's called the devil, John 8, 44. Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. The word means a slanderer. He slanders the lies of God's people before the throne of God. Revelation 12, he's called the dragon. It's the Greek word for a monster. Satan is a monster. He's called the enemy, Matthew 13, 39. He's called the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. We need to remember this before we jump on the bandwagon of what the world of unredeemed humanity says is good and true because the unsaved, they are under the control of the God of this world, Satan. Amen. Amen. And thus they are being used by him according to his will. Anytime you see the majority of the world going a certain way, you're probably better off going the exact opposite way because the majority of the world is under the control of the God of this world, 
Satan. Amen. He's called the king of death, Hebrews 2.14. And Isaiah 27, 1, he's called Leviathan. That's a term for a big, bad, ugly monster who dwells in the sea of humanity. Yes, yes. He was called Lucifer, the light bearer, King James, Isaiah 14, 12. He's called the liar, John 8, 44. Satan's essential nature is a lie. God's essential nature is true. His is the exact opposite. His essential nature is a lie. There's nothing true in the person of Satan, but he is a lie and the father of all lies. First John 3, 11 through 12, he's called the murderer. Ephesians 2, 2, prince of the power of the air. John 14, 30, the prince of this world. 1 Peter 5, 8, a roaring lion. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12, he's called the ruler of darkness. He's called Satan. He means a hateful accuser. That's the word most often used of him in the Bible. He's called the serpent. In 2 Corinthians 11, 3, and Genesis 3, 14, 15, we just read it. Let me tell you about this word serpent. It's a combination of two Hebrew words. One word means a hisser. Mm. <laughs> but the other root word means beautiful, a, be uh, a beautiful light. So Satan is a beautiful light who hisses. The illusion is to you know, all dangerous and venomous reptiles. Before they strike, they often do what? <laughs> Satan is a beautiful angelic being. Probably if God was going to enable us to visibly see him, we would be in awe of his beauty. Amen. We would look at him, and by virtue of his beauty, we would conclude there's no way this, this being can be evil. He just looks too good. Because we're on the looks. That's how we think. Looks at him. Looks must be right. You got a big church, you must be doing something right. You got a big car, you must be doing something right. You look good, you must be good. But this is what attracts people to him. But like that king cobra, he raises up and you get close enough and he says, and he will sting with a bite far worse than any bit of the state because his thing is meant to send you to outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Isaiah 14, 12, he's called the son of the morning. Matthew 4, 1, he's called the tempter. He's called the thief, John 10, 10. The wicked one, Matthew 13, 19. Some of his other activities are he loves to imitate God. That's his favorite thing, imitate God. He adds to the scripture, Revelation 22, 18. He does this to the sea. And this comes about now, adding to the scripture, as people claim to be worse than God. Say the Lord, Lord Almighty, huh? He adds to the scripture. Mm -hmm. He deletes from the scripture, Revelation 22, 19. He denies the truth of the scripture, Genesis 3. Did God really say it? Half God really said, don't eat from that tree. Come on, he pulls the scripture out of context. Matthew 4, 6. Come he conjures up false doctrines. 1 Timothy 4, 1. He does all this to deceive. He plants tares among the wheat. In other words, he plants fake Christians among real Christians to sow discord. Matthew 13, 24, 30. He hinders those who minister the things of God. 1 Thessalonians 2, 18. He tries to hinder the prayers of God's people. Daniel 10, 12 through 13. He accuses Christians before God. Or Revelation 12, 10. He lays snaps and trares and has, he lays snap, uh, snares and traps for the people of God. 1 Timothy 3, 7. He oppresses the people of God. Job 2, 7. He tempts believers into sin. Ephesians 6, 11. He influences believers to disobey God. 1 Chronicles 21, 12. Satan moves David to number the people. He, he, he blinds the unsaved to the truth. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. He steals the word of God from the hearts of the unsaved. Matthew 13, 3 through 4. You remember the, the, the parable of the sower, the seed is sowed, and, and Jesus said, the meaning the devil comes in and snatches it yeah. away. Uh -huh. And he can work lying, miracles, signs, and wonders. First Thessalonians 2 18, 2 89. Then the laws will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth, bringing an end to the appearance of his coming. That is, the one who's coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. Come on, Pastor. Satan 
hates and mainly attacks four specific institutions given by God for the overall well-being of everyone on the earth. What's the first one? Marriage, as defined by God in Genesis 2. One biological man to one biological female, he attacks marriage. He attacks human government. Genesis 9, God gave us government to, to keep us safe. Not to feed everybody, but to keep us safe. And to prevent lawlessness from going absolutely wild and rampant, but he, let me move on today. He hates Israel and he hates the church. But Satan is limited. He's not omnipotent. He's not all powerful because if he would, that means he would be equal to God. For Satan to be omnipotent or all powerful, that means he would have to share the same substance and essence of God. Jesus was all powerful. Why? He had the same essence and substance as his Father. He shared one of the same omnipotent power of God uh, with the Father. Satan is not omnipotent because he is not the essence of God. He is a created being. And so if he's not all powerful, why is he so successful? Well, he has one third of the fallen angels to do his work. And they have been dispersed all over the planet. Amen. And they affect every strata of society, every culture, every ethnic group to do evil that is utterly repugnant to the mind of a holy, righteous God, whom the Bible says is angry with the wicked every day. Uh -huh. Now those things I just gave you about Satan. The serpent reveals there is no being, no created being, <coughs> angelic or human, who has the power he has. No other human, no other angel can stand up against him. Now, says the revelation that Michael and <laughs> angels prevail. Didn't it say that? But see, Michael still has two-thirds of the angels. Satan has one-third. They won because of numbers. But one-on-one, -on -one, <laughs> nobody can stand up against Satan. No created thing or no created thing can stand up against him. All humans, no matter what their social, political, religious status, authority, or power, can stand up to Satan. And I had many things to say, but let me just say one. Well, one that proves it is, you're all going to die. Amen. The scriptures say that Satan is ah. Hebrews 2.14, therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also took of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, the devil. It is true that Jesus, through his bodily resurrection from the dead, has conquered death, both biological and spiritual death, and the second death. But we are not presently experiencing that aspect of the atonement. It's a done deal, but we're not experiencing it right now. Amen. For example, those of us who have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, we are saved forever, and one day we'll be delivered from the very presence of sin, and all things brought into the world by sin, including death, but we are not experiencing this right now, but we will. But until the day we are raised from the dead in our glorified bodies, death reigns over all, and the one who reigns over death, the king of death right now by permission of God, is Satan. He is the king of death. The mere fact that everybody still dies lets you know you and I cannot stand up to him on our own. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Let me help you sisters out. Well, maybe this is just happening in camp. Maybe this ain't happening where are you at. We got a large group of women here, and they're saying, Bishop so and so is my cover. Oh. Let me help you out. You're naked. Amen. Yeah. Amen. There's not a man on this earth Amen. can go toe to toe Amen. with Satan. Yeah. And the reason why I know is your covering, sooner or later, gonna die. Yeah. 
That means he can't stand up to the king of death. Furthermore, why do you need another covering other than your Jesus? Amen. It's all I'm, 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 I'm an apostle now, and my covering is you're, you're naked. Amen. You, you, let me move on. I start to say, go get saved, but I'm not going to say that this morning. I probably need to, but amen. Let me wrap this up. Amen, Pastor. Tell the truth. As we read the Bible and look at the power of Satan, and I don't think even this much, the scriptures has a lot to say about him because he's our enemy. As you read the scripture, you can clearly see the only one who has ever walked this day capable of crushing and bruising his head is this man who is the seed of a woman, but not the seed of a man, but also truly God of God. Yes. Listen, first of all, Jesus was born the seed of a woman. Listen, this is deep. I'm going to get out of here. The Lord was in the seed of a woman and not a man. <clears throat> Therefore, he never inherited the sin of Adam. Amen. Amen. That we all possess. Amen. Therefore, he had no inner sin that bent him towards evil. Amen. This is totally different than the rest of us. We are born with a sin nature. And because of this, it is impossible for any of us not to sin. You see, beloved, the mere fact that we have a sin nature on the inside means the ball game is over before the game begins. Yes. In other words, left to ourselves, Satan has the victory before the game begins because the sin nature we all have inclines us automatically to him and all his evil. Amen. But Jesus was not like us. He had no sin nature. Amen. Satan could appeal to nothing, no internal sin he had. All the temptation Jesus went through was from the outside. External. Therefore, nothing Satan hurled at him had power over any evil thought or thing that resided in him. Why? He had no sin nature. Therefore, he's been the only man ever born who from the moment he was born had the upper hand on Satan right. from birth. Satan had nothing to go to on the inside to draw him. And then not only was he a, a sinless man, he was also God. And because he's also God, he's the only one that has the power to curse Satan. You know, we, we need to understand that Satan is a spiritual being. Amen. No material weapon has any power against him. Amen. If you could explode the most powerful nuclear bomb right on top of Satan, he'd laugh at you. He is a <laughs> spiritual being. Amen. He's unaffected by material things and powers. Since Satan is the most powerful spirit angelic being in all creation, the only power over him that can crush his head is the uncreated, infinite, omnipotent power of God. Amen. This is the power Jesus had in his. For he is not only the seed of a woman who has no sin nature, and therefore Satan can't tempt him on the inside. He never was bent towards sin. He never did lean towards sin. He was sinless and righteous. But not only that, he was the very power of God. He is one with the Father in all things. He equally shares one of the same substance and power with the Father. He shares one of the same omnipotent power with the Father as he himself proclaimed. Matthew 20 and 18 after he rose from the dead. Uh, I like the King James. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All power is given unto me in the heaven and the earth. This is why the only seed and offspring of one who could possibly be the one to crush Satan's head to powder is none other than Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, and the Christ of God. Yes. Yes. The Bible says he came to destroy the works of Satan. 1 John 3, 8. The one that practices sin is of the devil. The devil was sin from the beginning. Then it says, the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works 
of Satan, the son of God, the seed of a woman. The reason why he came on the scene was to destroy the works of Satan, was to crush his head. And guess what? He did it on the cross. First Corinthians 15, 20, 26. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, by a man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits after those who are Christ that is coming. Then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power. That's talking about the power, the prince of the power of the air. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. Once again, we see the truth that when Jesus fulfilling the scripture, Genesis 3.15, he's the seed of the woman, the only one who could possibly crush the head of Satan into nothing. Once again, this clearly proves that Jesus he really is the promised Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the Gentiles. As I've been saying over and over and over, I say again and then say again. If Jesus can fulfill just one scripture and through this reveal, he's the only possible one to kill Satan, crush it. If he can do that by fulfilling one scripture, a half of a scripture, then most certainly, the rest of the 31,000 scriptures in the Bible is enough for us to make it. Amen. Amen. From this life to the one yes. to come. Yes. I got a sneaking suspicion scripture alone is sufficient yes. for you yes. and I who call on the name of Jesus. Amen. You don't need Sister Bonnie's so-called word from the Lord. You don't need to hear about the bishop's vision. You don't need about apostles so and so. We don't need to hear about prophet this, that, and the other. We don't hear, we need to hear about Sister Lulu. I just get it. I just sense something in my spirit. We don't need all of that. <laughs> Scripture alone yes. is sufficient to meet every need in the life of the believer in Christ, one true church. I really believe this further reveal of the Scripture or the doctrine of Scripture alone to be a biblical doctrine. Once again, that is states in the Westminster Confession of the Faith. The whole counsel of God concerning all things for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from the Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelation from the Spirit or the traditions of men. Scripture alone is sufficient. Amen. Amen. We can live by the word of God. We can die by the word of God. We can stand by the word of God. We can make decisions by the word of God. We can deal with one another by the word of God. We can have a right relationship with God through the yes. scriptures. Yes. Everything uh, we need, God has given us in this yes. written scripture. Amen. Amen. We don't worship the pen and the ink on this paper. We worship the God who gave it to us. And his full authority is in this book. And I say without any apologies and without any reservations, this Scripture alone is enough. Yes. And I will stand on it and live by it. Yes. The day I'm out of here, yes. then when you get to heaven, you're going to see the same word forever still. Yes. Amen. 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 It's enough. It's enough. Yes. Amen. 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 I think I said enough today. Let's pray. Amen. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, I pray for thank for the word of God. Um, Lord, um, I know that I'm being extremely detailed. Right. And I'm moving very, very slow. But Lord, I want those who go to this church. To um, become saturated in the Word of God and to really.
grab a hold of scripture alone as being sufficient. It's the only way we can avoid being deceived. Yes. Scripture is the only way by which a man can be saved. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Everything that we have to do with God comes through this word from God. And so, Lord, this is why I'm moving slow and trying to bring this truth home. Lord, help us to believe in the scriptures alone. Above all of us, no matter who that might be. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus alone. There's no other way to be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. To those that are in live stream, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you are separated from God. The only way to bridge that gap, which sin is created between you and God, is through his son, Jesus Christ. And the same is true for all in this building today. If there is one of you never given your life to Jesus Christ, and you feel so moved by the Lord this morning, would you just do that by raising your hand? Father God, we want to stay faithful in the gospel. Lord, we have done that this very morning. Lord, I pray um, there's any who's not saved, Lord, convict them. Lord, draw them. And Lord, we know only you can do that. And so, Lord, we work with you and we pray for their conviction. And you turn them to a saving grace of Jesus Christ. Perhaps there's one here saved. I want to be a member of this church if there is one today with your raised hand. Once again, I want to pray a special prayer for the entire Mingo family, Sister Ruth, uh, Sister Robin, uh, Minister Tracy, and uh, just the whole Mingo family. Uh, they lost their uh, senior statesman, that clan, uh, for the Clarence Mingo. Uh, good brother in the Lord. I remember the day he came to know Christ as Savior and uh, we were on Maple Street and we were doing two services that time and uh, he came to the early worship service. It may only have been three or four there that morning and I'm not even sure who worked with him. I think it was Pastor Smith uh, prayed with him and gave him the gospel and uh, came to know the Lord. And from that day on, as long as he was in Canada, faithful man in this church helped me out a lot. Encouraged me every every time he hear me preach, he encouraged me, sit me down and encourage me. And um, he's going to be missed. Uh, but we know God knows best, amen? amen? But we really, really pray for the family for strength uh, to make it through tomorrow. I remember my mother died it seemed like the closer I got to the day of the funeral, the worse it got. Yeah. And so I know the time up to that final departure, it's a rough deal. And so Lord, we pray that you will strengthen them this day, tomorrow, and in the grief days that are to come. Yes. Father God, we pray for our land. Uh, just so much going on, I don't know where to start. Yeah. Lord, I'm going to say, if you know how messed up we are. Lord, do what you do in your own will, in your own way. Father God, I praise you and thank you for all things today. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. And God's people say amen. 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 amen.